going back to the women who wrote, right? And actually centering them in our scholarship, in our understanding of what being a black woman is, particularly being a black woman in Africa, all right? One of the things that I, I'm hoping to critique, this was not part of my, um, my, my, my presentation anyway, but I, I felt that I need to highlight it, um, is the importance of not just looking at texts or searching for texts. Because there are multiple ways or avenues in which knowledge was disseminated in Africa. And I think for us, as decolonial scholars, it is important for us to move beyond the conventions of what or the ideas of where knowledge lies. So therefore, our concept of the archive should move beyond literary texts. Of course, there are women writers, we know. Well, at least some of us do. <laughs> All right? There are plenty of them. However, it is important to move beyond that. Uh, for instance, I mean, if we want to talk about black feminism, how about reading or listening to Brenda Farsi's work? If we want to understand liberation or the struggle, particularly from an African, you know, woman's point of view, and particularly issues around agency, why not listen to Tandi Thomas' why? And also bring her into the classroom, and that's what I do, by the way. That's what we do at, at Timali, just so you know, right? <laughs> okay, so even when we write, we bring in these aspects. Okay, there's an article of mine that's going to be in the perspectives. It starts with a song. I love songs. <laughs> right, it starts with a song, a, uh, Emily Sunday, that says, you will read about it. And for me, that's very important, right? So I'm just going to quote something from Toyin Falola concerning what a ritual archive is, or particularly the archives that we should actually go into in search of voices that come from Africa. Okay? So I will quote. He says, by ritual archives, I mean the conglomeration of words, as well as texts, ideas, symbols, shrines, like a uh, when I king Ndombaya Gog, that in itself captures it's an archive in itself, carries a whole lot of knowledge in there. All right, and then you also list images, performances. So how when a mamang a dance when we dance. All right. When you look at Bonda Deva ZCC, eh? <laughs> all right, that in itself is an archive. When you look at, you know, the women back on Nigeria, particularly that particular dance, I get it right, but that distinctive, you know, that, that distinctive uh, dance here thing, that is an archive in itself. All right. So, and then he also says that. Um, so he adds on, and he also says that, that objects, right, document as well as speak to those religious experiences and practices that allow us to understand African world through various bodies of philosophies, literatures, languages, histories, and much more. By implication, ritual archives are huge and bounded in scale and scope, storing tremendous amount of data on both natural and supernatural agents. The ancestors, gods, the good and the bad witches, right? Life, death, festivals, and the interactions between the spiritual realm and the earth-based human beings. All right. So these are actually aspects that are quite important in our understanding. And if you go back to the aspect of uh, the gods and the ancestors, and particularly what U Menok Trila highlighted earlier, right? About African spirituality to our African philosophy, which is actually grounded around notions around African cosmology. Okay, the interesting part is she did highlight our concept of unkulunkulu is not gendered, which is true. But the interesting part is in the African context, the first manifestation of God on earth is a woman, was a woman, and this woman created everything we see according to the narrative. 
in Africa around creation. I think you could be building though. Nah. All right. So our own narrative of creation, it was a woman. So the story goes, which you find in the end of my children, by the way. So Umutwa, in his narrative or explanation of the, this particular narrative, he speaks so good. Ah, all the mountains, all the things that we see in this world, including the moon, the stars, literally everything, were created by Umama, right? The great being. But for some reason, at some point, you know, after wondering, why am I creating all these things that seems frivolous, right? She actually protested, protested against Unkulunkul. And that, for me, say something really, really powerful about protest and resistance, particularly in speaking out and ensuring that we actually have a voice, right? It informs the particular voice that we also find ourselves having to want to share with the world, right? And I think one could go as far as saying that this particular voice as well informed that, informed the book that you wrote. Right to also largely resist, and even our criticism of feminism, I I I also appreciate as well, right? Um, but what I will do, just to go into my own presentation, uh, which I had to prepare yesterday, <laughs> um, it is centered around my own research on the women of Marikana, right? Particularly the wives of the slain miners, right? So what I try to do with my particular research is, well, apart from understanding their own st struggles and the survival strategies, is to actually bring them back into the discourse in a different way, all right? Um, other than them being appendages to men, all right? Uh, <laughs> which I think as well, we're finding this in what has happened to Mesobuku, all right? So in my presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, African feminism, right, with the ultimate intention um, to get us to think about a decolonial approach to contemporary African feminism. But before I do that, I'm going to touch on second wave feminisms, all right, um, as a way of emphasizing uh, the importance of acknowledging that feminism is not homogenous theory, but that it is constitutive of multiple feminisms. In my presentation, I'm going to draw, like I said, on my research, and what I do is particularly focus on the concept of the family. All right? I do this because largely, um, in my own research, I use the family as a unit of analysis. However, I feel that in the African context, we cannot just take that particular unit as it is without interrogating it, all right? And the beautiful part is you have feminists who've already done this, right? Critiquing the family, you know, sort of problematizing the concept of the family, all right? In the process, uh, some of you might not want to get married, ultimately. But anyway, <laughs> I will not take responsibility <laughs> for your decisions, okay? <laughs> okay. So, you know, there's basically multiple forms of feminism, right? Uh, you have black feminism, Chicana feminism, Asian feminism, and da, da 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 all sorts of feminisms, right? And most of these actually were originated from, or uh, somewhat originated from the belly of the beast, which is the United States. Um, and what these women were decided to do is basically come together in response to critiquing white feminism as very, very problematic, and to some extent not representing their own struggles. All right, um, so and then we know this basically this is what happened. And the most interesting part is, um, which for me, you know, slightly drawing from a decolonial um, avenue, is the fact that they also incorporated or used socialist feminism as a base that unites all of them. All right, I will try and explain this as I go on. So their criticism are also traced to the moments of the 60s and 70s. However, this does not mean that. Uh, these forms of feminism began in the 60s or 1970s, all right, because we know that feminism actually predates that particular time. Uh, black feminist thought in America is traced back as far as the 19th century. For instance, the women like Sojourner Truth, 
okay, who questioned the universalized aspect of what a woman is. And also in the process acknowledging that this idea of what a woman is is not actually extended to me as an enslaved black woman. All right? So, well, that's not easy, but, you know, critiquing, I get it. Because everybody was saying a, a woman is treated like this. A woman is this. And then she looked at her own reality and then was like, ah, clearly I am not a woman. <laughs> All right. So, and decolonial scholars, what they've done is noted that Race is actually a defining feature of distinction. I think Upo, oh, 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 Dr. Nokchula highlighted this, right? When she spoke about the concept of the line of the human, right? That actually distinguishes who happens to be women and then who happens to be the other women, all right? So, and then uh, we know that racism, which is an economic construct, determined at the distinct experiences of women who within a modern colonial gender system were all oppressed but white women experience racial privilege. However, those who are othered experience prejudice, right? That we know. So much of the second wave feminisms are tied together by socialist uh, feminist ideals and socialist feminism or feminists, what they've done is expand on the Marxist notion of exploitation to include other relations in which some benefited uh, from the labor of others, for example, in the household and child raising, right? So the various feminisms share the similar base with socialist critique against privilege and class as an exclusive and social analytical tool to explain oppression. What socialist feminists, uh, socialist feminists, what they've done is, or well, their arguments was, look, we understand we're in Marx, you know, you actually privileged class and say our oppression is explained by this. However, there are other aspects, such as sexism, all right? And then you, can, uh, you cannot really say, in as much as, yes, we were trying to offer a historical account of sexism, however, you cannot put it or understand it as a byproduct of class oppression, okay? So sexism in itself then, got, or rather, us analyzing sexism, then got as a particular prestige, right, in the process of analyzing or trying to understand uh, black women's experiences. So they went on to say that although sexism predates capitalism in Eurocentric society, it is noted that industrialization brought with it a distinctive gender order in which women became subordinated through the division of productive and social reproductive spheres facilitated by wage labor. So in as much as we may say, Uguti, I know we don't, you know, um, for instance, uh, <laughs> the irrelevance of feminism, um, particularly black, you know, radical feminism in the African context, um, you know, seems to be contexted. However, the fact that we live under a capitalist, right, society, then actually makes this particular tool of analysis relevant in our context as well. All right. So, he then, oh, sorry, Michelle then uh, went on to say that, for instance, in this process, in light of the modernistic and hierarchical valuation, right, which is basically productive labor, so productive labor is basically the kind of work that you do in some company somewhere, and a lot of the social reproductive labor, which is located within the household, was actually devalued, and this is largely the, the roles that women actually perform, right? So within this capitalist system, you find that productive labor, which you find in some company, is then remunerated through wages. But then the kind of labor that women, who as a result of industrialization, were excluded right, from the labor market, their own labor, we know her it's not paid. right? I mean, who's paying you for raising a child? Did somebody pay you for breastfeeding your baby? <laughs> and even for that matter, for reproducing a, a consumer for that matter later on, I get a regular body speeds, and then they demand the speeds, they demand all these cell phones. So in the whole process of socializing your child to be a consumerist in, in a, within a bourgeois society, no one is even compensating you for that. And the very fact that consumerism is sustaining capitalism, but you're not paid for it. All right, sort of captures these particular distinctions around which uh, sort of our labor 
you know, is considered to be important. So now, going back, and then so we say, also say that, for instance, you had sexism in a lot of our emancipatory projects, right? The revolutionary movements and so forth, right? And which basically, within these spaces, a lot of feminists were actually criticized, and this is basically something that continues to happen today, all right? That we're told, Guti, I know feminists are actually divisive that feminists are actually destroying homes and so forth. So therefore in the struggle, particularly the black struggle or the Chicana struggle or whatever form of struggle, we need to come together because race, all of us, we are oppressed on the basis of race, right? So now your feminism or whatever gender struggles, they come after, they will, they will come after, all right? What's the most important thing is for us to be liberated on the basis of, and these are the arguments that we find within all right, within the liberation movements, within all the nationalist movements that women were a part of. What feminists have argued was, but, okay, we get that, yes, we're all oppressed on the basis of race. However, there are all these aspects that are taken for granted, particularly our own, basically our own uh, oppressions that we find even within our own movements. All right, for instance, hence the women like Boa Varela Davis, uh, highlighted these criticisms within your, you know, the Black Panther parties and so forth, right? Um, so yeah, and then also feminists, what they've done is, particularly black feminists was within the movement, now I'm, I keep working on feminists, by the way, now I'm referring to black feminists and not white feminists, like I've erased white women in, in this presentation, okay? So they're not there, okay? So it's basically Chicana feminism, African feminists, black feminists, all sorts of Feminism, right? Except white. So what they did was they critiqued the naturalist assumption about what a woman's role is. And as you know, Guti, even in the pamphlets, ne? These guys, boy, Web Dubois. I believe E.B. Dubois, by the way. All right? Some of the pamphlets that they actually produced in their narrative on how they understood women was largely that as appendages, right? So basically, it's as you are in the home and so forth, and then our struggle ultimately is to allow you to go back into the home safely, sanely, right? And cook for us and do all these things. And these are the realities of our struggles in as much as we may want to deny. But these were the realities. Okay. So and then, this is what one of the uh, women that ooh, Dr. E highlighted. Let me put my TV on the side. Uh, was that O Maria Lugons, right? What she did was highlighting the importance, or rather highlighting that, or asking, why is it that fellow oppressed men are also, in as much as because they understand, you know, that we're all oppressed, why is it that they are actually not sensitive to the violence that black women actually face? All right? And in response, and if you are sensitive, then what you would do is to ensure that you are also not replicating that because you understand. You understand the struggle. You understand the pain of being black, of being made black, of being turned black, of being othered. And then you also understand, my fellow sister here is othered. Yet, the very same are black men who understand these struggles right, are the very same who then, for some reason, try to exercise pseudo power <laughs> over us, right? So this is what, what black feminists, right, or second wave feminists for that matter, highlight, right, what they bring to the fore, right? So, I mean, there is a particularly expected empathy from oppressed men, Right? For them to actually understand our own struggle, but for some reason this is not happening. Sometimes there is, um, you know, there are those obviously who actually are aware, all right? There are those who are actually trying and are trying to find ways of changing uh, the situation. However, the effect, of, the effect of manhood or being men in itself is problematic. And I conceptualize men in this, or rather, I speak about men as a concept, by the way as a concept, as a construct that is relational, that is relative, that is basically grounded on ideas around hierarchies and opposition 
and dichotomies. All right? So to be a man means you have to be on the other, basically you are on the other side of what a woman is. You cannot be a man without a woman. And we know that a woman is a subordinated construct. And it all right. So that in itself, as a concept. So now, if you go back, now if you go back and we highlight ooh, the works that Umem Ayoronke, for those who have read her work, she refers to notions of Anna males and Anna females, which actually predate, all right, these concepts of manhood, because we actually turned into men, we are also turned into women. Hence, her title, the title of her book, The Invention of Women. Invented. So in, in this particular invention, we then also create, sort of embodied all these problematic aspects of that particular modern colonial gender system. So being aware with the pseudo power, all of us being oppressed, and our labor being oppressed or being socioeconomically oppressed, you know, and Marxists, what is it, Marxists, uh, referring to uh, most of our particular, well, locating most of us within uh, the industrial capitalist system. Uh, so we were defined as workers, <laughs> right? And then Otoma Sangara then said, um, or argued that women's fate is bound up with that of the exploited male. This is so in a patriarchal society where there is an institution, oh, by the way, this is me. <laughs> so this is so <laughs> in a patriarchal society where there is an institutionalization of women as appendages to men. Hence, oh, she's gone, <laughs> right? A, sort of the footnoting of a mesobook, right? Because in this particular art, we understand women as appendages, as extras. After all, I get a, a religion also, which is basically serves as the foundation, yeah, socialization, and our ideas about who we are in society and so forth, says that women are, but it's okay. <laughs> Imagine, right? So if you come from a rib, so you're an appendix, you're, you're an extra, you know, you are there, all right? So those ideas also inform how we locate women, how we remember women, as evident in that particular article Uzandi highlighted. Okay, so Sankara went on to say that the solidarity of the um, the, the solidarity of the oppressed women, or solidarity oppressed women have with oppressed men, must not blind us um, in looking at the specific situation faced by women folk in our society. It is true that the woman worker. And the simple men are exploited economically, but the worker wife is also condemned further to silence by her worker husband. Where that your husband or me in? It remains that she's still silenced. Okay? Or when she gets back from work, or me and husband, instead of helping her to cook, he will watch television. <laughs> right? So these, these, are, these are some of the challenges. Of course, this is not a universalized experience. We do have men who cook. Progressive men, by the way. Thank you. Right? Who cook, who wash dishes, who wash our laundry and all these things. Okay? So, I mean, that's, that's basically sort of these generalizations. You must also accept that there are exceptions. Okay, but even with those exceptions, it does not mean that they, outside of the household, even if at the household you may be progressive, they still benefit from systematic patriarchy. Okay, so the fact that uh, income between men and women is not the same highlights this. All right, that this is basically institutionalized patriarchy whereby men actually earn more. I mean, we may deny statistics show, statistics do show that men earn more than women. All right, so it's a fact, right? So now, sorry, so then Usangara also highlights that actually what men, or particularly the oppressed men, what they're doing is precisely what other men 
which is basically the white heteropatriarchal, uh, <laughs> you know, cisgendered <laughs> white man or European or imperial colonial or, or colonizer, right? Sort of, that's basically what they did to other men. So now they're also doing it to women. Yeah. All right. So and then he says, the, oh, no, I say, <laughs> the capitalist construct of the family, right? So now I'm going into the critique of the concept of the family. And I'm, 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 I'm actually defining it or understanding it or helping us to understand it as a construct. All right, and a particular construct there because there are multiple forms of families. For instance, in Africa, we have a variation, or rather, we had a particular variation of what a concept of a family is. And then you also have a European concept of a family. It's also heteronormative. And the importance of heterosexuality in a modern colonial capitalist world will become clearer as we move along. But for now, I will highlight that this modern colonial capitalist world is dichotomous and hierarchical. Gray areas, and gray areas, the in-betweens are not tolerated, and this we know. And basically, this is an age-old European disease, intellectual disease, right? Basically, it's either or. There's no in-between. So all the in-betweens are problematic. Right? Hence our treatment of transgendered people, of bisexual people, of homosexual people, or people who don't fall within these binary constructs of gender. Okay? Because of this idea around you have to be either or. Right? And this is although like uh, uh, you know, sort of decolonial scholars seek to trace this, you know, around the idea or the time of modernity, but it actually predates. And I argue in one of my ch uh, chapters is that well uh, I borrowed the argument from Anima <laughs> All right, so I also reiterated um, that a, sort of the foundations of European society in itself was dichotomous, was hierarchical. All right, for instance, when you go into, when you study the likes of Plato, when you study the likes of Aristotle, you then see, Uguti, this, this basically this logic of either or. Black or white, man or woman, right? Nature or nurture. So basically, this binary way of thinking is found within the foundations, right? You locate, located within the foundations of European society, European philosophy, European ideologies, and this particular either or logic becomes so natural that it informs every aspect of European life. Right? And this European life was then extended into the rest of the world. Okay? Was imposed onto us through colonialism. Right? And basically today with imperialism and so forth and neocolonialism. Alright? So that's basically the reality. So now with this in mind, the oppositional and hierarchical nature of the modern colonial wars and class critique, including the question of a gendered assumption that influenced women's lives, feminists call for an intersectional approach which captures the multidimensionality of social inequality experienced by othered women. Right? Women who are further than others, so I use othered women. So I'm not going to get into that because she has already explained what intersectionality is. However, intersectionality as well has also been critiqued that this we know, right? It's been critiqued basically for literally sort of um, a, being grounded on the whole ideas of body politics, all right, or identity politics. Um, and the criticism also lies with the fact that it's become ahistorical to some extent, right? Without actually going back and understanding that these identities also are linked to certain systematic structures. All right. So these structures again, going back to who Dr. Edith highlighted this earlier, right? So even with the Ed and Stir, will not even change anything. Even when we put or place certain women in politics, as Zandi highlighted, it's not going to change the system itself. All right, because it's very problematic. All right. And then, however, I then say or argue that actually the concepts in themselves, in as much as yes, there's this particular criticism, but the concept of black women for me, captures this historical right, idea of what blackness is. For instance, 
Uh, the concept of Chicano, or black women, captured the simultaneous expression of race and gender, and the socialist arguments of the black feminists addresses the issues of class, right? So for instance, in the South African context, the concept black women captures the intersections of race, class, and gender, because blackness is biblical conceived it as a socioeconomic category that determined the inferiority of people classified as black, right? So we only understand the concept black as a socioeconomic construct. <laughs> okay, so, so I have to rush through this. Um, all right. So yeah, and then uh, and then I also want to say that, but for some reason, uh, there are criticisms uh, within a lot of our a lot of our nationalist movements and so forth around you know basically criticism of uh, feminism and largely the popular idea that feminism destroys the, the you know, sort of the family. Um, what I wanted to do was also highlight where these criticism as well come from, you know, particularly from men who then argue good tea. You know, you're destroying families because the family was not just this, you know, social reproductive arena, um, but for black people, it was a tool and particularly a space in which, you know, the organization and resistance, right, because he, so it's basically an important tool around organizing and resisting what imperialism and basically white supremacy and white supremacist oppression. And this largely was grounded around how, you know, sort of the black family was destroyed, you know, in the South African context and also in, in slave, sort of uh, slavery America, right? We know, I mean, black people in jail everywhere, right? Their families were destroyed, right? Men and women were never really allowed to be together. Right? And basically the systems allow this. So when, we, when, when black men and a lot of people who critique feminism right, for destroying families, I, I sympathize that actually this comes from that particular space of understanding the family as a space in which we can wage resistance against you know, um, 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 white supremacy. Okay? But this does not take away the fact that within the black family itself, there are challenges that we need to address, right? There are challenges that we need to address um, because this, and, and uh, we can do this if we understand and conceptualize the family as a bourgeois construct, right? As a capitalist construct. Um, and also, what this family, particularly in the South African context, whereby we through the, you know, sort of labor and like, migrant labor system, right? Because we know the migrant labor system literally destroys our families. But that in itself provided opportunities or provides opportunities for us to understand how gender, or rather, you know, or problematize notions of gender in the African context in a sense that you have women, right, who then perform so-called masculine roles in the absence of men, right, which then sort of critiques this um, idea that, you know, is sex determined, right? That sex, your sex determines everything, all right? So out of that, out of the tragedy, we, we get uh, opportunity to understand, you know, you know, ideas on identities or gender, um, you know, and, and, and sexuality or sex, sorry, not, sexu not sexuality, sex in the South African context. Um, and then... Also, I mean, we've, been had, we've had other, a whole lot of scholars, right, who have criticized uh, this notion of, of sex, um, sort of, of sex or biologizing uh, gender for that matter. For instance, women like, if you are you may see Dangaremba, Oyaronke, Erna Bay, even in South Africa as well, right, sort of those who are studying uh, sort of the Zulu, the Zulu state, okay, have found that women, or women's roles were not necessarily determined by their sex. Okay, so there are other roles that we actually performed, right? So the idea that we are oppressed on the basis of sex does not is not actually universal. It's not a universal um, notion, and this is where again, a, a, a of us um, sort of the opportunity to criticize sort of Western notions of of feminism, right? So now I'll just. Rush back, uh, or rush, skip everything, and then just go down to the concept of African feminism, right? So they are, or rather African feminism, we know that it's contested and it's also a controversial concept, often rejected by many women born in Africa, 
right? For instance, Ubuchi Emecheta, a Nigerian novelist, rejected the label feminist as a name from without, what has been highlighted. And the idea, and the idea of, it, of it being oppositional to men made feminism repulsive to her. However, she endorsed the concept of womanism, which is also a label from without, by the way, right? Um, from Alice Walker, a, a black uh, um, African-American feminist. Um, but O Walker argued that womanist is to feminist what purple is to, not, to love in them. So now with the various criticisms highlighted, uh, women like O had so Wims proposed that for sort of proposed concepts like uh, Africana womanism instead. Um, and she argued that Africana womanism is an ideology created and designed for all women of African descent. It is grounded in African culture and therefore it necessarily focuses on the unique experiences, uh, struggles, needs, and conflict between the mainstream feminist, black feminist, and African feminist, and the Africana womanist. Africa for women, Africana womanism differs from African feminism, she argues, right? Pinky Mekwe also as well, then went on to sort of elaborate more on what African feminism is by saying that African feminism is anti West, is literally completely anti West. Its, its foundations are not linked to Western feminism, right? It is not informed by Western feminism at all, right? She then argues that it is actually anti imperialist, you know, anti imperial. It is pro natal, that we actually do want to have babies, okay? Um, and to have babies, obviously, you have to have a man. <laughs> or oh, well, you don't have to with artificial insemination these days, right? Right? Um, but, I mean, even in that con, if you don't have to have a man, by the way. <laughs> right? Um, but then she argues that it's non-oppositional to men because there is recognition of a common struggle with African men for the removal of the yoles of foreign domination and European-American exploitation. This common struggle does not deter African feminists from challenging oppressive regimes, by the way. Right, ideas and cultures. Okay, African feminism is concerned with the everyday struggles of women for basic services, for basic services, as we've noted with the women of Margana. All right, uh, who are actually also organizing, by the way. Okay, though they may not call themselves feminists, but what they're currently doing could be labeled as feminist work. Right, um, and then. Ooh, Professor Mac Patricia McFadden argued that the intersectional relationship between political economy as a critique of and resistance to capitalism and imperialism, or, um, or sorry, imperial domination to, of Africans and the development of a radical discourse and the stance that it is embedded in the lives of African women has always been a significant feature of African feminism. So our struggle is anti-imperialist, anti-capital, because without addressing those aspects, African women and their liberation will remain a dream and a myth. Okay, and then in basically what we have to do is locate our struggles in understanding the current political economy, right? That we live in a neoliberal world which is influencing our daily experiences and our daily lives and our struggles. All right, and then sort of those, these ideas, even when we speak about, uh, for instance, you know, one ways of, or other ways of empowering black women or African women is basically giving them jobs and so forth. Those are actually quite problematic as well. It's a good thing, it's wonderful because then you're going to reduce the level of poverty, right? Um, that most of, most of African women, but that will not re address the fundamental problems that have led you know, African women to be where they are, okay? So the importance of actually having a decolonial political economy approach to the struggle of African women, and then maybe one day you will have a seminar on that. But anyway, so I'll just end here <laughs> so that we go home. <laughs> Thank you.